Welcome to the Story Behind Clue series. In every episode of this series, we talk about the history of one of the original weapons used in the game Clue. This series may not be appropriate for all ages, and listener discretion is advised. This is the final episode of the Story Behind Clue series. I hope you've all enjoyed talking about the weapons in this classic game, as well as the 1985 movie. In this episode, we're going back to the very beginning to talk about the game itself. I'm your host, Emily Prokop, and this is the story behind Clue, the game. But first, a quick message. I had the idea recently for a little side project called Podcast Share I'd love to get your feedback on. This would be a Twitter account that is run by a different person every week, and their only job is to tweet what podcasts they're listening to. The idea is podcast share curators let others know what they enjoy and hopefully start some conversations along the way with either the podcast themselves or other listeners. Podcast share will be starting up in a few weeks and nominations are open for future podcast share curators. To find out more information, visit podcastshare.net and be sure to follow at Podcast Share on Twitter for updates. In 1943, Anthony Pratt, a self-proclaimed introvert and patent clerk with dreams of becoming a concert pianist, enjoyed playing parlor games based on popular mystery novels at the time, such as works by Agatha Christie or Sherlock Holmes novels. These live-action games were known as Murder. And the object of the game was to figure out the randomly appointed murderer before they were able to strike down everyone playing. To put this into context, this was a different time when murder was something one could joke about without fear of offending anyone. When air raids and blackouts became commonplace during World War II, it was harder to play these games. To help pass the time, board games and card games became more popular, since they could be played around a table instead of having to go around the house. Pratt, missing the fun of playing murder with his friends, came up with a game board version, which we now know of in the US as Clue. By the way, Clue is called Cluedo in the UK. You might have known that already. Thanks, Paul. Cluedo is in fact a portmanteau of the words Clue and Ludo, which is Latin for play, and also another popular board game at the time. In 1944, Pratt filed for a patent for the game. A few years later, he sold the rights to Waddington Games in England, and in 1949, Parker Brothers acquired the U.S. rights and renamed it Clue. Pratt was able to live off the royalties to become the concert pianist he always dreamed of becoming. But once the funds ran out, and he already sold the patent for much less than it ended up garnering, he had to go back to his life as a patent clerk. But when he died in 1994, his gravestone in England makes it known that he was the inventor of Clue. The original characters were different from the ones we know today. Instead of the six weapons we're most familiar with, and the ones the past episode of this series talked about, there were ten, including an axe, a shillelagh, a bomb, a hypodermic syringe, poison, and a poker. In the English version, the wrench was known as the spanner, which we talked about in The Story Behind the Wrench. Remember in the last episode, we talked about other actors and actresses up for the role in the 1985 movie? Well, in the original game, characters were a bit different as well. The victim in the original game was supposed to be rotating, but became relegated to Mr. Body as we know him, or Dr. Black in the original version. Other characters we don't have anymore include Mr. Brown, Mr. Gold, Miss Gray, spelled with an E-Y as the British do, and Mr. Green was originally the Reverend Green, Colonel Mustard was Colonel Yellow, and as I mentioned in the story behind the rope, Mrs. White was originally Nurse White. The layout of the mansion was a little different as well, including a gun room. And since the game has been updated every few years, newer versions have even taken out the conservatory, because contemporary players may not even know what that is. By the way, a conservatory can be a portion of the house made up of windows and acts as a greenhouse, but also a room to practice arts and humanities like playing music or reading literature. When Hasbro bought out Parker Brothers in 1991 and Waddington's in 1994, the game began a series of updates, including adding more weapons, like dumbbells and a trophy, and changing characters up a bit, like turning Miss Scarlet into Cassandra Scarlet, 
a tabloid actress. And Professor Plum is now Victor Plum, a billionaire video game designer. By the way, for those who may have misheard me, Victor Plum was added to the game in 2008. Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire, in which there is a character named Victor Crumb, came out in 2005. Maybe it's pure coincidence, but the conspiracy theory part of my mind wonders if there isn't some sort of connection between the similar names. Or maybe I'm just grasping at straw broomsticks. If you followed the story behind on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter, a few weeks ago I posted a picture of my coworkers and I playing the Golden Girls themed version of the game. And don't worry, no one was murdered. The mystery we had to solve was who ate the last piece of cheesecake. While Hasbro has come out with a number of versions of the game, another game company called USAopoly has made licensed versions of the game Clue, such as the Golden Girls version I played, as well as Game of Thrones Clue, Rick and Morty Clue, and Harry Potter Clue. Who knows, maybe Victor Crumb is a part of that one. It all makes sense now. One thing I realized when playing the Golden Girls version a few weeks ago is if you're really in it to win, you must pay attention, not just when it's your turn, but when other people ask questions. It may seem like a game of chance, but there's actually a strategy to how the game is played, and that involves not only keeping track of what is shown to you, but also what is not. Even when watching the movie, by the time the scenarios are hashed out in the end, when you re-watch it, you'll notice certain things like Mrs. Peacock missing after the cook is discovered to be murdered, or a female, presumably Miss Scarlet or Mrs. White, speaking before killing Yvette. Other strategies involve throwing other players off the path by making suggestions that include cards you may already hold in your hand, or staying in a room you already know the murder didn't take place in, so you can move other players and weapons into that room to foil them. The game has also been the basis of books in the 80s and even a video version, because apparently one Clue movie is not enough. The Clue series butler you heard at the beginning of the episode and throughout the series was played by Paul from Rick and Paul Heal the World. Information for this episode was sourced from The Big Game Hunter, Mental Floss, Cracked, and more links which can be found in the show notes at thestorybehindpodcast.com. And just a reminder, if you haven't already, follow at Podcast Share on Twitter for updates to this side project I'm working on and to find out how you can become a Podcast Share curator. This episode was brought to you by the story behind executive producers who support the show through the Patreon page at patreon.com slash the story behind Stargate pioneer from gunnageek.com Matt from the one word go show Sam Dunn Diane from history goes bump Scott Smith from recovering from religion and newest executive producer Dan Brennick from Netflix and swill. Thanks for listening. <laughs>